they are the fabulous learning nerds. Cause if you're tired of the old ways of getting it done, you've got the fabulous learning nerds. Scott, Dan, and Abby are making it fun. The best ideas that you've ever heard. So everybody spread the word. They're gonna keep you with turning the fabulous learning nerds. Fabulous learning nerds. Hey everybody, welcome back to another fantastic episode of your Fabulous Learning Nerds. My name's Scott Schutte, I'm your host, and with us again this week, you love him, Dan Coonrod. Dan the man. Dan. What's up, Scott? You know, um, I'm doing good, I'm, I'm getting adjusted um, to this fabulous daylight savings time, um, so that's great. And I heard that mm. they're going to make it permanent, which I'm super excited about, and we'll see if they actually do something that I want which is great. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great down here in, in the land of, of Florida. How about you, oh, sir? Florida. I'm, I'm, in case you couldn't guess, fair to Midland. Uh, there you go. Fair to there it Midland. Is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, I don't know. I'm super torn on daylight savings time. Um, uh, I'm super excited to take the common sense approach of stop messing with the clock. It seems like that would be easy. Also, though, I know we tried this like in the 70s, I think, and I'm not that old to remember, but I'm definitely uh, old enough to have read about it. And uh, I don't I don't I, it didn't go so great. It didn't go so great. Sending kids to school at like eight o'clock in the morning when it's still dark seems bad. This is an easy fix. All right. We, just roll, we roll back. We roll back the clock. And that's what we said. It I that's I the 100% deal. 100 percent agree with that. I love that idea. And we're gonna roll back the clock, everybody, and then we're gonna we're gonna live with it, right? That's that's kind of how. See, everybody that's thinks that's going. a great idea. That's so it. that's it right there. That's I'm very stuff. curious to what um, our co-host Abby's gonna have to say about that. So, ladies and gentlemen, you love her, the um, Duchess of Design, Abby Dawson, everybody. <laughs> Abby. Hey, Scott. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm not fair to Midland, but I'm great. <laughs> I heard that your end of Q1 was not a great experience for you, though. Yeah, it kind of uh, snuck up on everybody, and then there was a little bit of hair on fire, but it's all right. One more week of it, and we'll get it through. Maybe Q2 will go a little smoother. Well, one would hope that Q2 would go smoother. Mm -hmm. I would say that no matter how bad that op uh, opportunity was that it's nowhere near as bad as other opportunities in your lifetime. Do you guys sure. do you guys get like Q, <laughs> you guys get like Q three or so. Q four crazies? Yeah, I mean, I think my biggest thing, and we we're gonna have a guest who helps us talk about this a little bit more today, is like people. Uh, you have these ideas of what you're gonna accomplish, and then you get down to the wire, and you're like, "Can we do it? Do we have time?" And then you just try and like push through and get as much as you can done all at once because you said you were going to do it, so you feel like you have to do it, and then nobody knows how the hell you're going to do it in the amount of time left, but... Yeah. I, yeah, I, I mean, I've been guilty of it too, but I think everybody does it where it's like a goal gets set at the end of the year, and you're like, ah, oh, I got a whole year, and you go, and you go, and you go, and you go, and finally you hit, like, November, and people are like, oh my god! Ah, it's the end of the year! <laughs> this isn't done! Go, go, go! And, like, the last, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oops... <laughs> And the last little yeah, bit of time is exactly. just crazy. Oh, yeah. Uh, I sent out some messages this week and I was like, hey, just so you know, like there's seven days left of like really working time to get this done. I don't think it's going to happen. I know it was a Q1 objective. And they're like, oh, no, no. Here's all the stuff I owed you like for three months. <laughs> so it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. Ready, no. fire, aim, folks. That's what we're doing, right? We're going to ready, it, fire, aim this. We do this all the <laughs> No. Well, yeah. maybe. I don't know. I know that our guest this week is going to help us sift through all of this stuff. I think he brought three or four shovels for us, um, <laughs> which is going to make it a great, great episode. Everybody, um, we've got Mr. Ron Reich here, and he's got some amazing stuff to chat with us about. Um, but we're going to get to know all about Ron in our segment that we call What's Your Deal? Hey, man. What's your deal? Ron. Hi, Scott. 
What's your deal, man? <laughs> what, what, is, what is my deal? That could go in a lot of different directions. Uh, number one, it's cold up here. Uh, in, in New Jersey, I'm here in Florida. And in late March, I'm not supposed to have to walk the dog in a winter jacket. That's not fair. Uh, be, Define be cold, sir. I mean, for us, 65 degrees is cold. That's what I mean in my coat. Well, how it's, cold is it? It's in the 40s. Also, okay. I lived, true, full transparency, lived all my life until recently in Minnesota. So like okay. 40s is bikini weather for yeah. Minnesotans. But yeah, no, I get it. That's pretty cold. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. All good. Mm -hmm. You know what? The All month good. of March is an interesting thing. We'll get back to you in a minute. But I think March is just one of those, um, you know, April Fool's is coming. So you think that winter is over, but it's not. We're going to remind you that winter is still here until like June, right? So that's kind of <laughs> what March does. Anyway, so it's cold up there. Um, tell us a little bit more about your journey. How'd you get here? How'd you get to where you're going to be talking to us about baby hey, stuff know, today? Scott, it, it really is an interesting story. Uh, yeah, the very long version, which I won't tell, probably just you know, the, the medium version, if you will. I began my career in uh, human resources all those years ago. And long story short, I was working for a small HR consulting firm. I think there were there were five or six of us there. We were all friends. And for a number of different reasons, we decided to shut the doors. I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, moving out. I liked HR. It was fun. It wasn't something about which I was passionate. Out of nowhere, out of absolutely nowhere, I got a telephone call from a recruiter in Dallas, Texas, Tom Sparks, who absolutely refused to tell me how he found me. I got an opportunity with Toshiba. The competencies are the exact opposite of what you are. Toshiba's looking for somebody who has a real strong training background and some HR. You've got a strong train, you've got a strong HR background and some training. I know the people there are so well run, I guarantee you I can get you in front of them. Your job is to get them to flip the competencies. I went in, I talked to them, they flipped the competencies, and I have been in training and development ever since. Uh, it's 28 years later now, uh, with a uh, I have to do the math here. I guess about 11 or 12 years of corporate experience. And 17 years ago, I started my own business. And I've been doing leadership development, organizational development, management development work, the executive coaching, really just the whole deal. Well, that's fantastic. Um, we're big fans of leadership and learning here on this uh, show. So we're super excited to have you on board, um, even if it is a little chilly up there. So I think that that's great. Um, <laughs> And, you know, your uh, your topic is pretty, pretty timely, especially in Abby's world here. Um, all about uh, all about setting expectations and why they're so important, not just in learning, but also in leadership. And so with that, folks, let's go ahead and dive into our topic of the week. Setting expectations. Ron, before the show, we talked a little bit about some research. And what now? Tell our audience why setting expectations is so ding dang important. Yeah, yeah. It, it truly, as we were talking before the show, the number one reason organizations, departments, and individuals fail in the workplace is because expectations are not crystal, crystal clear. And I mean, it, it is as simple as, you know, it's just, you know, like, like we were talking before the show. Abby, you never told me you needed this by the end of the quarter. You know, you know Dan, you didn't, you didn't tell me, you know, what, what the budget was. So I'm sorry I went over your budget. That, that's your fault, not my fault. I mean, just, you know, all these different sorts of things. Expectations need to be crystal, crystal clear. And the way... The, the, the way I like to do this when, when I'm doing sessions, I will, when, when I'm going to introduce the topic, I will ask my groups, are there certain policies, expectations from an organizational perspective by which every single person is expected to abide, regardless of level? 
And everybody always nods their head. Yes, of course there are. Okay, fine. What are the consequences if somebody violates an organizational perspective, uh, expectation or, and or policy? And, you know, typically what we come up with, well, they could get written up, and if it's severe, they could be terminated. Exactly. That, that's all well and good. Those are the organizational pieces. Much more importantly for me, and I hope what we're going to be talking about today, I'll also ask the question, are there certain departmental, are there certain team expectations that are unique unto your own department and just any teams of which you are a part? And everybody will nod their heads. And it's like, okay, fine. How clear are people about these expectations? Or, you know, are your colleagues, are you crystal clear about these expectations? And so often, you know, 80% of the people in, in my uh, experience with clients, with, with participants, whatever, will shake their heads, no, we're not crystal clear on that. That needs to change. That needs to change. Because if they're not crystal clear, I mean, how, how, can, how, how can you possibly lead a group? How can you work within a group most effectively unless the expectations are clear? Mm -hmm. If I could piggyback off uh, on the research, I'm a huge fan of Gallup. Um, yeah. did a lot of leadership with Gallup. And uh, are you, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Core 12, right, Ron? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So at the bottom, Core 12 is this engagement model. If you go look it up, it's awesome. It's this like pyramid and people have to have certain things in order yes. to be engaged. In order to find engagement, by the way, is doing a great job just because, right? And at the very bottom is this question, I understand what is expected of me at work. That's like a baseline level. And if I don't understand what's expected of me at work, I'm out like I'm totally disengaged. And my experience is that um, that can be tricky because sometimes and you know this and we'll get into this. So like sometimes my expectations can change so I could think I'm doing a great job. Like the example you gave of, of Dan going over budget like Dan's going out there and he's going to go get it. And he thinks he's doing a great job and he comes back and he's got this new client and he overspent the budget to get it but he's feeling great and then you tell him no that was wrong and just totally sap his uh, you know will to do a great job that's right and then and, and what, what's what's worse is that you'll end up losing tier, you know top tier talent like I'm, I'm ready to you know when that happens i'm ready to pull my hair out and that's i'm right. wearing a hat because i don't have a lot of hair anymore you know what that's i'm saying right. so yeah at any rate yeah that's my rant yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it, 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 it is just so, so true. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I know we're going to reference a different book later in the show, Scott. I'm going to bring another one up, though, because the, the point you're making is very, very important. One of the best books uh, I've read recently, being a voracious reader, is called Leadership as Language. And it's written by uh, the author is uh, David Marquet, and I, I really, really like his work. And one of the things he talks about in the book is when you begin a major project, he said you want to have formal stopping points, if you will, throughout the project. I, I can't remember the exact term he uses. In other words, if we have a six month project, we're going to have we're going to stop everything after two months. And I'm just I'm taking the two months out of the air. It can be anything. It can be a month. It can be six weeks, whatever. We're going to stop two months and we're all going to meet and we're all just going to talk about how's it going? What's going well? What do we need to do differently? What has changed about our original hypothesis that we can get this done in six months? And then, then, then it becomes incumbent upon me and Dan. Uh, you know, as as one of the contributors here, how are we doing budget wise, everybody? Ron, you know what? We've got an issue here. I'm concerned. You know, whatever it might be is that, you know what? You know, Abby says, I don't know if we have the resources to get this done. What, whatever it might be. The point is, though, the expectation 
we are going to stop in two months and we'll talk about it. And if anything goes haywire before then, expectation, please, you need to let me know so that I don't get surprised. Because again, we're all in this together. Let me, uh, let me ask you a quick question, Ron. In your, in your estimation, why do you think there's such a struggle in setting expectations? Uh, Dan, can, can, can you go into it in just a little bit more detail for me? I mean, there yeah, are absolutely. a bunch of ways I can go with that. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Like, I, you know, I've, I have found plenty of places like where I've worked, where the, the base expectations are easy. Like, Hey, here's your job responsibilities. Here's, yeah. you know, here's, here's the basic stuff. Here's the, you know, don't, don't be bad. Don't do illegal stuff. Do your yeah. job. <laughs> Great. But there's always oodles of other expectations, but whether they, they're, they're just part of company culture or anything, or just like the way that things get done that never get written down. And then you find yourself like, hey, I, I completed this task. In your example, like, hey, uh, I got this client, came over budget a little bit though, but we're good. It's like, no, you can't do that. Oh my God. Uh, why, do you, why do you think that there's such a, it's so difficult to map out and write down those those expectations? Why there's such a, I don't want to say aversion, but maybe I will. Why do you think there's such an aversion to that? I think I think a lot of, of what you're talking about, Dan, for me, my immediate thought is a lack of psychological safety. And, and what I mean by that, number one, uh, I'm going to I'm going to go I'm going to go to the, the fourth level right away of, of psychological safety, which is called challenging, at least based on the, 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 the information that I have or the books that I've read on this. And if you're my boss and I, I might be concerned about challenging you on, you know, the budget, on the resources, on, you know, whatever it might be, because I don't feel safe. And one of the reasons I don't feel safe, number one, I you know, if, if, if I don't know you real, I, I'm not sure I want to say real well personally, if I if I don't feel safe with you personally. I'm going to be careful with what I say. That's the first level of psychological safety. The second level is learning. And learning in that if I don't feel safe, I'm not going to be real comfortable coming to you, even with basic questions. Dan, I'm not clear on this. I'm, I'm not sure where I should go with this. Or, and, and actually, maybe, I'm, maybe I will even go back to the learning level to answer your question, is like, Dan, I'm not sure about the budget here. What are, you gonna, what are your thoughts on this? What kind of flexibility do we have with this? And, and again, the, the point for me is I need to feel safe in order for me to come to you, talk to you about issues that are going on. And I've, I've, I've experienced both sides of this where I have absolutely felt safe. And there are other times where it's like, if you think I'm going to say a word, you're crazy because I'm going to get my head torn off and I like it attached. Thank you. <laughs> no, okay. Ron, That's good. <laughs> that resonates so much with me. I've definitely been in roles. I'm someone who wants. I'll call them boundaries, but they are also setting expectations of this is what I'm comfortable doing. This is what I want to be doing. This is what I need from you or what I'd like to do working with you in a working relationship. Uh, but I've been in roles where that is, it's not okay. And it's, it doesn't even have to be spoken. It's just clear that it is not okay to um, yeah. have those things in place where you are just supposed to do what's asked of you come hell or high water. Um, so I, I hear that. In my soul. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I can give you an example, too, uh, Abby, and I, I, clearly I'm going to leave the name of the vendor out of this. Uh, I've, I've done quite a bit of work for a pretty, a, a, a pretty well-known vendor. And the content that this vendor has in their public classes, in my opinion, fair at best. Okay? It's fair at best. And so what I try to do is to add some of my own material, some of my own content, in order to make it richer, in order for the in order for the participants to have a really good experience. 
What ended up happening, a participant went to the vendor. We didn't go into the workbook hardly at all, and I don't understand that. So now I'm having a conversation with one of the top people at this vendor, and I give her so much credit. She set the expectation for me very, very clearly. Ron, I'll tell you right now, I have absolutely no issue if you want to add your own stuff. That's fine. That's wonderful. It does add value. Here's the expectation. What you must do is you must go into the workbook in every single module for at least one or two things. That's fair. That's fair. And so I do that. We're on the same page. We're all winning. Instead of, I'm not going into the workbook or, you know, you must, you know, you must follow the workbook and, you know, exactly the way we wrote it. And if they had done that, I would have said goodbye because I'm not going to do that. So, again, I, I hope that. I love it. This is fantastic. Here's the question. I'm a leader. I understand that expectations are important. How do I deliver them in the most effective way possible? There, 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 there are a, a couple of things here. Uh, Mike, Mike Krzyzewski, coach at Duke, wrote a book a while ago. Uh, I'm not going to remember the name of it. It might be Lead from the Heart. It doesn't matter. And what he talked about in the book with setting expectations, number one, uh, you want to have as few expectations as possible, just as few as possible, because otherwise I'm micromanaging. I am absolutely micromanaging. You know, I said, I want you on, you know, just, just taking this out of the air for, you know, for Duke basketball. I want you on the floor. 15 minutes before practice, I expect you to be you know, uh, stretched and ready to go five minutes before practice. And then I want, and then, and then, and then it's like, guys, I want you on time for practice. You know what to do. That's it. And I mean, to, and, and, and again, really, as few as possible, keep them as simple as possible. And, and you know, for me, it's about trust, too. It's, it's just about trust. You know, a, along the lines, too, I, I love this. Uh, I'm going to go back to what David Marquet says in his book, Leadership is Language, where he, he just doesn't believe at all in telling people what to do. And I, I've tried to adapt this in my own sessions after having read the book. For example, okay, we are going to start right at 9 o'clock, everybody according to the clock in the room here. That's when we are going to start. And at nine o'clock, we start, regardless of what anybody is doing. I'm not going to say, Abby, we're starting, please phone down. You know, just say, Scott, excuse me, we've started. No, 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 no. It's your job to realize we've started. And, you know, take, taking a break. Everybody, let's take a break, okay? We will reconvene in 17 minutes. In 17 minutes, we're going to start again, regardless of who's in the room at not, or not. I'm not going to go running outside. Abby, we're starting. Come on. No, 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 no. You know the expectation. That's it. Let's go. So, I mean, I, again, I, I hope that's making sense. And if you don't mind, guys, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to add something to this because for me, I believe strongly it's been a big part of my success. And I say that proudly, too, please, not boastfully. And I hope it's coming across that way. Uh, very early in, in, in any quote unquote public sessions that I do where people don't know each other well, I just set the expectations real simply. Number one, and it, it's on a flip chart or a slide, whatever it might be, please actively participate. I need you to actively, actively participate. Ask any questions that you have. Also, everybody, I want you to talk to each other. When you're answering questions, talk to each other. I don't want to be the focal point. Make eye contact with your colleagues, not me. Much more powerful when you're talking to each other. Also, everybody, we need to have one conversation at a time. Whenever someone is speaking, we honor that individual. We listen to that individual. 
because if I hear side conversations going on, I will tactfully say, please, everybody, Dan has the floor right now. We're listening to him. This is the big one coming now. Everybody also, I need your phones on vibrate, no texting, no emailing while we're in session. It distracts me. It distracts your colleagues. And again, here's the next really big point with the expectation. Folks, I know fully business goes on when you're in a training session. If something comes up for you and you need to take care of it, by all means, take care of it. Simply step out of the room so you don't distract the rest of us. Can we all agree to that? Everybody says yes, boom, done. There's not a problem in the world. And over all the years that I've done this, I have had to talk to people about, quote, again, quote, unquote, violating these expectations maybe three or four times. That's it. It's just like, Dan, you agreed, please. Quietly and, again, privately, Dan, you agreed we wouldn't text. Is there a problem here? Well, it's just taking me a minute. Dan, please step out of the room because if I allow you to do it, it, it gives permission to everybody. And I can give you some live examples, some real examples, if you'd like to hear them. That damn guy's a troublemaker. <laughs> no, I, I love that you said that you hold people to it, because I feel like if you set an expectation and, and allow people to overstep it or you don't hold people to it, that means nothing um, to them or to you. Um, and, and it's the same with process, not just in leading um, a live training, but in processes, too. Um, I, yeah. Exactly. Oh, and, and, and Abby, I'll tell you, a, a mistake I made. And again, I, I freely say this. I was doing a public class for a vendor. We had a very small group of people. I think it was four or five, whatever it was. And I set the expectation. And because we were so small, I allowed someone to text while, while we were in the session. And somebody put it in their feedback. Ron didn't practice what he preached. And she was right. She was absolutely right. And I, I mean, how can yeah. I possibly argue that? You know, and, and it, that's fair. That's just absolutely fair. And I, you're, Abby, again, it just resonates with me because I lose all credibility if I don't enforce them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've we've been changing some processes in, in our team that we've been doing with the rest of the company. As we've scaled, we've had to put in some um, like systematic processes where we were just doing relationship exchange. And by that, I mean, like they would come to us with a request and we would work with them and do it. And I said, we can't maintain that at scale. So we have to put in like a request process and follow that. And that transition takes some um, reinforcement. So the, of course, they're going to be people who say, I've never done the form before. I've just always reached out to so-and-so. And we have to say, I get it. Go through this little bit of uncomfortable process to say, our expectations have changed and our process has changed. And we need, I know you've done this before, but we're, we need you to do the form. Um, and, and if we hadn't held up our end, if we'd said, oh, he doesn't want to do the form, we'll just continue with him. He's always done it this way. We would have never gotten past that, that uh, shift. And, and you know what? It's it, it's interesting because uh, when I worked at Toshiba, my my boss resigned, and we all loved Jack. We just loved him. Someone new came on board. Okay, Barbara Barbara's her name. I won't use her last name, although I I, I could because she turned out to be the best boss I ever had in my entire career. Oh, give Barbara a shout out. <laughs> Barbara Fulmer, if you are listening, you have helped to make me what I am today. And she knows that because I have told her that on numerous occasions. <laughs> or if anybody knows Barbara Fulmer out there, uh, she she set the expectations for us. And we, you know, when I say we, the staff, we're all unhappy with them. It's too much. This is stupid. She's a jerk. She's requiring way too much of us, you know, all, all of that, just, uh, I had, we had, we, I had just gotten back from, I, th I somewhere in the country, whatever. We had had a meeting with her where she beat us up for the, for these few days. I am a diehard, diehard New York Giant football <laughs> fan. Please work with me on this because I am going somewhere with it. At, at the time, I was not a season ticket holder. I am now. 
at the time, I had tickets for the game on this particular Sunday. Came home from California in a terrible mood because, you know, we had just gotten beaten senseless. I went to the game Sunday. We lost. So now I'm upset. I come home and I was like, man, it doesn't get worse than this. You know, I got a terrible boss. My The Giants lost and everything. I, I went over to my bookcase and I just pulled the book out for whatever reason and I just opened it. Wouldn't you know? If you're working with somebody who's very, very difficult, one of the best things you can do, give he or she exactly what they want. Just give them exactly what they want. Because number one, they'll get off your back. Number two, if you give them exactly what they want, they might get promoted and they won't be your boss any longer. Or... You might get promoted, and they won't be your boss any longer. And and you know, again, the, one of the big things, and I'm going to I'm going to tie it back, Abby, to what you were talking about before, is when expectations change. I can only speak for myself here. I need to make sure that I'm open minded about it, because when I sat down and looked at what Barbara really wanted from us, it wasn't bad. It really wasn't that bad. It was just that we don't want change. <laughs> This is no good. She's a jerk. And she wasn't. What she It was about 10 minutes of extra work. That's it. And again, if I had just had an open mind and looked at that earlier, I could have saved myself a lot of trouble and a lot of angst. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the importance of understanding ego in a room. Right? That's right. So if you can just take the ego out of it, then it's not a problem. Well, and, and, and you know what? In, in, interestingly, too, though, Scott, and this is where I give Barbara so much credit as well with expectations. The one thing that she, we had monthly reports that we were required to submit to her. And in, when she first started, it was 27 pages of documentation monthly that she wanted from us. It was like, this is insane. We got together and it, it was a wonderful technique. All we did was put every single piece of documentation up on the wall so we could all see it. We just looked and talked about, okay, what's necessary, what's unnecessary, what's where's the overlap, what's repetitive. We got that 27 uh, pages of documentation down to seven, which was very, very manageable. Seven pages as an expectation is fine. And Barbara was open to that which was wonderful because if she hadn't been, we would have, a couple of us, I know would have walked out. I want to back up just a minute. Cause I um, love your example of here, especially from a learning perspective, right? So if I'm doing group facilitation, I'm starting off my session here. I used to call them house rules. I don't know what, what you call them or whatnot, but I, I want to talk a little bit about, all right, I'm going to go ahead and design uh, a learning for instructor-led, right? So we're going to do an instructor-led training, um, in which case those expectations are super important. I mean, they're important in uh, virtual learning as well, right? Anything that's CBL, computer-based learning. How important is it to, um, you, from a designer perspective, to to actually put those in or do you think it's important to say to the facilitator, like, you do your own? Like, I have my own opinion, but I'm really curious what your thoughts are when it comes to setting expectations, either house rules or whatever, and, and what kind of ownership we want to give to our facilitators to do that on their own. Does that make sense? It does. Scott, Scott it does. For me, I mean, I and any time I have a leader's guide designed by someone else, I always want to know what they expect from me. No no pun intended with that. I welcome the opportunity to have it in there and 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 just see, okay, these are the expectations that you know that that the designer is looking for from the course or whatever it might be. I also am going to take I'm not sure I want to say liberties with that because that's not what I mean. I'll make certain adjustments that I believe are necessary based on the needs of the class. And and just and and just what my experience has been, uh, and 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 again, when and as as an example for me, I had a I had a colleague at an organization where I worked, where I mean the the leader's guide 
if you ever deviated from that, she would go out of her mind. And I'm dead serious. It would be like, the reader's guide says on page six, you know, point A, sub bullet three, that this is how you do this is this activity. And I was just like, it's the leader's guide. It's not the leader's commandments. You know, as long as I'm not deviating and, and impacting the integrity of the course and it's adding some value, I have no issue if anybody wants to make some changes. None. I'm going to. And again, not drastic. And, and, and actually, every, you guys, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give you another example of this. When I worked at Toshiba, the advanced sales training course that we were doing, I was uncomfortable with our probing module. And I changed it on my own. And I, I put something new in. I'm doing this course in Manhattan. Barbara, the woman I mentioned earlier, she and Tony, who was her boss, flew in from California to see me do these, this three-day course. The probing module starts, uh, I think it was the afternoon of day two, whatever, it doesn't matter. As I sit here and talk to you, I swear I still remember. I'm sitting, I'm standing at the flip chart, I'm ready to start the probing module, and I'm having a conversation with myself. What do I do? What do I do? Do I do it the way it's in the leader's guide or do I do it my way? And I was like, I'm doing it my way. I'm going to do it. So I did. And I'll never forget. Tony comes up to me afterwards, and I will not use the language he used because it's inappropriate. <laughs> what was that? Reich? He never called me Ronnie. He always called me Reich. Reich, what was that? And I'm like, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> that was the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. That was fabulous. I was like, okay, great, great, great. And then he then he made his point too, which was absolutely valid, and I'll never forget this. He and Barbara both said, you will never, ever make changes like that without checking with us first. You must check with us. Even though the, the work you did was great and we love it, Ron, you changed this drastically, and that's not acceptable. That made sense to me. That's fair. You're going to make drastic changes. We need to know about it. So I'm good. That that's how I I got into instructional design. I was a trainer, and the content I was getting, it wasn't up to my expectation. And uh, I had a great leader at the time, and I was like, "Hey, this content isn't working out," and uh, so I'm going to rewrite it. And it wasn't our content; it was a it was a client who we supported content. And he was like, "Oh, that's really bad. That's really bad. Like, are you sure that's what you really want to do?" And I was like, yeah, like literally I'm, I've got this much time to train them. I'm training them. And then I'm rushing through the material because I've got to get through it in enough time to actually train them to get the job, to do, to do the job. And he was like, well, you know, if you mess up, you're on your own. And uh, so I, I still remember uh, I'm finishing up a class and this person who I don't know comes walking in. And sure enough, like I've got this module I had made up on screen and he's like, what's this? And I'm like, oh, this is laptop training, yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I'm Daniel. Nice to meet you. He goes, oh, I'm so-and-so. And I'm the training manager for the client. And I'm like, oh, cool. So I'm probably fired. This is great. <laughs> and he's like, no, this is great. But why did you change everything? We had a really long talk. And uh, that's like, like, it's that exact, that level of, of understanding. And also like the follow-up of like, hey, you can't just, just do that. That got me into ID. Where I was like, oh, wow. Like, I, I need to understand like how this works. That's awesome. So, Ron, I have a question for you. For our, for our folks who are listening, if there's someone out there who says, I think I could do a better job setting expectations, I'm not quite sure where to start. For an example, like, what would you suggest someone ask themselves so that they can go into a project or a new role and set some good expectations? What kinds of things, um, as far as like, if I wanted to, to have some new expectations with my boss about what, I, what kind of jobs I want to take on in the future, how would I even start that process of, of working with myself to, to begin? I think probably one of, the, one of the first questions I would ask myself would be, what do I want to accomplish here? What, what do I want to accomplish? What is, what is my level of experience? We, you know what are what are my skills for this project, and where 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 am I going to need help? 
And I think that that's where, Abby, a, a, a conversation, a, a frank conversation needs to take place between the employee and the boss. And, 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 and just talk through, you know, just, just for example here, you know, Dan, as, as we begin this, this is, you know, I, I think this is, this is my level of expertise in this area. What do you think? Or, you know, where, you know, where do you think I fall here? Here's where I think I'm going to need help, Dan. We, you know, what do you think about this? Where do you think I'm going to need some help? And that way, it's 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 mutually decided. So they're not my expectations, and they're not Dan your expectations because then they're yours, and I don't. You know, I I may not have fully bought into them. And for me again, Abby, a lot of this ties back to the psychological safety. I need to feel safe going to Dan and talking about this. Uh, and, and again, if, 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 if I may here, uh, at the pharmaceutical company, we had a real, real big problem with one of the uh, directors. His entire staff was threatening to resign on the same day. I mean, they, they, just, they just hated him. I mean, there, there's just no other way to put this. And the feedback we were getting in training, he's a micromanager. He is on top of us constantly. And I mean constantly. And so what we decided to do was to put him through a mini version of situational leadership and set the expectation with him and his staff. Tony, before you assign anything to any of your staff, you need to sit down with the individual or individuals, whatever it might be, talk about what's their level of experience. What's their, you know, what, what's their willingness to get this done? And then mutually, you need to decide what style to use because you're directing every single time. And there are a bunch of times you should be just delegating this. So I, I hope that kind of clarifies a little bit there. Yeah, I think so. Um I think a lot of times that there is a lot of fear of even broaching the conversation, but the idea of making it a, a discussion rather than red lines on a page definitely changes the, the atmosphere. Cool. Well, um, I think that this has been a fantastic conversation. I, I love the idea of psychological safety. Um, I love the idea of ensuring our facilitators have some say in what they do. Um, as we start to wrap things up, one final question that I would ask, though, in, in, in just making sure that, you know, our, we speak to our design brethren that are out there, our sisters and brothers in design. Like, I really, really, really think that no learning is complete without said expectations up front, what the, what the objectives are going to be, right? What do you expect to learn? And then how they can expect to go through that. Because I feel like Anytime we skip that step and I've skipped that step and I've seen lots of people skip that step all the time, I really feel like we sure change our audience and we really inhibit our ability to deliver the kind of results we're looking for. Scott, if you don't mind, I, I really I want to pick up on that just for a second, because every single session I do, that's the first thing I say. That is the first thing I say. Everybody, my name is Ron Reich. Key point I want to get across to you right off the bat, I'm going to facilitate our session. I like to begin with the word facilitate because the last thing in the world that I want to do is stand up here and lecture. It's not going to happen. We're going to have a bunch of different discussions. We're going to do some activities. We're going to be doing this and this. And then, you know, finally, I just wrap up expectation. Given that, everybody, can I count on you to participate? Yeah, okay. So people instantly realize this is going to be fun. This is going to be interactive. I'm not going to sit here and talk at you. Groovy stuff. Hey, as we um, as we begin to wind things down, Ron, is there anything you really wanted to talk about today that you didn't have a chance to, that you wanted to impart to our audience? Uh, you know, I mean, truly, everybody, I, I have just so, so enjoyed the conversation. It is, it is always a pleasure, and I, I mean it. I hope you believe me. It is, it is such a pleasure to sit down with people who know what they're talking about. 
and and and, ju- and just have these kinds of conversations. <laughs> I mean, at least with Scott and Abby. <laughs> 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 it is just we fun. got you fooled, Ron. We got we got Ron fooled. <laughs> so, Ron, could you do me a favor? Could you go ahead and uh, let our audience uh, know how they could better connect with you? Sure. Probably the the best way to connect with me, everybody. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about my background, is to go to my LinkedIn page. It is Ron Reich, R E I C H. Uh, my company is R L B Training and Development. Uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me directly, please feel free, and I'll be glad to talk to you. I'll be glad to make uh, or make any recommendations for you, have any conversations. My email address is uh, r.reich2006 at gmail. Well, certainly, certainly happy to have had you on the show. Great stuff, folks. From Ron Reich, all about setting expectations. If um, if you need help with that, please reach out to him. It's super, super critical to your business performance and success. Danielson. Yes, Scott. Could you do me a solid and tell everybody Absolutely. how they can connect with us? If you haven't already, party people, reach out to us at learningnerdscast at gmail.com. This would be me setting an expectation. It would be super great if you did send us an email. If you're on Facebook, you can find us at Learning Nerds. And lastly, for all of our Instagram peeps, Fab Learning Nerds. Scott. Hey, folks, that's going to be it for us today. Could you do me a favor? Hit that subscribe button. Share this episode and this podcast with your friends if you like us. If you're picking us up on, oh, say, iTunes or Stitch or any kind of podcast, or do us a favor, send us a review. We'd love to hear how well we're doing or where we can improve and it helps us get our message out to more of the people like yourself and with that i'm scott i'm dan i'm abby and i'm ron and we're your fabulous learning nerds and we are out